what I'm saying is mm -hmm. uh, just I, I understand that it falls in the banner and that we have our own sentiments and so forth. I think one of the things that frustrates me hugely is mm -hmm. that as an Afro nation, um, like this Afro nation biz, yes, man, we're a nation. <laughs> Um, is that we I feel like there's generally a lot of manipulation yeah and um, you know it's a horrible stereotype but people have made the statement that if you want to hide something from a black person you should put it in a book hello everyone welcome to Aiko's medley the ego's nest the am today I have got my friend um, Claudia coming on to talk about um, the issue of fighting racial injustice. So let's start by introducing Claudia. Claudia, who are you? Who's Claudia? Uh, I, who's Claudia? Claudia is a speaker, so I am, and I, I'm a dentist and I'm a writer. I'm based in Glasgow and my heritage heals from Kenya in East Africa. Mm. Uh, so that's who I am, which is good. I think East that's Africa all. in the building, Sasa. It's <laughs> Anna. <laughs> You also wrote that book. You you released a book um, a month, or two months ago. So Claudia is also an author on the final. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've seen. So we need to get you back on that tip. Okay, come talk to us about money. Drop some okay. dime because we know yep. that's another universal topic out here. So yeah, but today we're going to be um, delving into um, racial injustice. The response, to be specific, the response how we as Black people. So now we're taking the focus onto us as Black people, which I think is important to do. So yep. thanks for coming on. Now, me and you have had a few back and forths on Instagram, on Facebook, but I think there's an opportunity for us to just bring our thoughts together, as we always, we just always end up on the same page anyway. I think it's just how we get there. So, yep. talk to me, Claudia. We've been talking about how we respond to racial injustice as Black yep. people. Yeah. Obviously, one of the main things that people have been doing is the protesting. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a few talks with MPs, MSPs, and that kind of thing. Um, what have you noticed? What, what have you noticed about the response specifically? What, what part of the response do you think we need to look into? So I think the first place is to, is to say that I understand and I really feel the pain. And when, when something, you know, when you see someone violently murdered in the street okay. by someone who shows no remorse, I like 100%. I, I, I understand the response. I see it. I think for me, it's um, my, where I come from is about being specific and being consistent. Those are two things, being specific and being consistent. So I understand the pain of it. And um, my, my, my question for a lot of people is, you know, there's layers to this response that are not specific to the issue so i always ask people what what is it that you're protesting is it police brutality is it systemic racism is it somebody that said something to you is it somebody that rolled their eyes to you let's narrow this down and become very clear about what it is that we're protesting <laughs> it's true it's true sorry i'm just describing my own experience but you know if, if we're specific, then we can create specific measurable changes. Mm -hmm. The issue is when people aren't specific, you have videos and films from the 1930s, 1940s, people colorize them and they make it feel like it's happening today. Mm -hmm. And if we cannot acknowledge the progress that we've made because mm -hmm. we don't know where we're going, then we always end up in this emotional space and there's an emotional visceral reaction that kind of, lights up and no one goes anywhere. I wrote a post which um, annoyed a lot of people. I was like, fire and gunpowder can't sleep together. You know, when gunpowder goes off, there's a massive explosion, but people move on and they spend the rest, you know, they're like, oh, a bomb went off mm -hmm. and it was a sad day and we move on. And my thing as someone who protests racial injustice and I hate this thing is about trying to get people organized in a manner that we systemically in a very in a very logical manner tackle injustice everywhere we see it consistently frequently so that we actually get rid of it um, and you know it's fine for you to go and protest and kind of wave a flag or whatever it is you want to do but let's become effective in our measures because we can see the protesting although it creates a lot of conversation it's not doing anything we keep doing the same thing and we're not getting different results so i'm really trying to encourage people to become more specific and let's 
come to an end point that we all agree on. So for me, let me actually ask you, what is the end point that you're looking for? The end point that I'm looking for is education for people. I want to ad address the part about prejudice. Okay, I want to address the point about sometimes we don't think we're being racist, but we're being racist. So for me, that means what that means as part of the response I'm trying to encourage is conversation, something as simple as that. Good where white people can talk to black people about this thing and everyone not get so emotional, get so offended, everyone not so be so shocked about what's happening to my black friend or my white friend. I want to address that. I also want to address the fact that black people feel they need to work four times as hard. They feel like this is ingrained. Mm -hmm. That it doesn't, I don't know if it affects me, but it's something that um, breaks my heart because if I had to talk up to friends about um, careers and jobs and entrepreneurship, that's a mindset I don't like to meet because entrepreneurship is already challenging as it is. You know, climbing up a professional ladder is already, already challenging as it is. So for people to, when you're having a conversation, for people to say, oh, well, well you know, um, they may not hire you because you're black, you may not get the money because you're black, or you may get the funding because you take a black box. That, that, that's sort of ingrained that because you're black, it's going to be, there's hurdles already, there's that work as four times as you can. Of mm -hmm. course, I'm Christian, so I always, I always, where my higher identity that you know I'm in Christ, you know, the fact that if he's opened the door, no one's gonna shut it if it's his purpose is gonna work. But I just don't think it's 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 his it's his plan for the mindset. And the funny thing is it's not his plan, but it's a reality for some. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So there's us being in Christ and then there's also a lower truth that well actually this is the way things are. For example, we're in Christ, you know, we are righteousness, but every day we wake up to our fleshly nature that we have to fight and subdue and remind I'm in mean, Christ, you know, I'm very sure like, you have to remind yourself of that, that fact, but that, 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 that lower nature still exists. So that, 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 the fact that that is still people's experience that they actually wake up and they go to work and they may not be hired or promoted because there's enough black people at that tier. And the fact that that's happening in the church. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, you've seen the whole C3 thing about how, the pastors have stepped down because they were preventing black people from entering certain spaces because they felt it may not appeal to the white audience as much because, well, you mm -hmm. know, black people on the face of the church can be very intimidating to a white audience, that sort of thing. So the fact that that exists within a church, Claudia, that, 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 that sort of thing, it really, it really, it gets to me. You know, so that's yeah. what I want to see. Obviously the chances of me having um, a brother in the streets who's going to be, you know, knocked down by three police. It's, 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 it's there since we, we see Sheku's thing, so we know it's there, but it's minimal. It's not like in America. So for me, I'm all about the systemic thing and the relational aspect of okay. it. That's what I would, I would like to see happen. I like, yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I did, which was hilarious, is that I remember when I was applying for a job, my face Mm -hmm. Dagger was on my CV. Now I have quite a. Who does that? They told me that's that's what everyone was doing. So I, I was applying for jobs, and my face was on the CV because that's the advice that we were given. My name does not sound obviously African, and I couldn't get any interviews. So what I did, I had a conversation with the principal of the school. I'll leave him out of this. But what I did is I removed my picture from the. A CV and what I found was I went from getting I had one interview out of like a hundred applications and I found that my interview rate massively increased which you know oh. is an experience and it happened and there's people who've changed their names and so forth to try and fit into yeah. culture and so forth yeah. um, and I love what you're saying about conversation and catching people's prejudices and I think if we're going to catch people's prejudices number one let's get into these spaces and get involved and have the conversations and um, what I find really interesting is when you know we're so I, I, I do I'm very involved and possibly sometimes too vocal in policy making in Scotland and what I find frustrating for me is when we see individuals of uh, BME background, what they present at the table is a fictitious version of their own life experience. And when you get them into a room um, where it's my, they're you know, in the majority, what they say there and what they say on the table becomes very, very different. And so when, you, yeah, so when we talk about prejudice, when we talk about prejudice, I, I really want us to, so it's not just about, it's not just about educating white people. That's I hate that. Yes. It's about 
every, catching prejudice every time we see it and calling it out for what it is. Yeah. And if we find ourselves in positions of privilege to use our power in a manner that will bring um, healing and elevation for everybody. And so I get in trouble a lot because I call out those prejudices from people where I'm like, okay, you are spinning a line and a mantra that actually I don't think is reflective of me. I don't think it's reflective of the pe people in my friend groups, but you who are in a position of power is touting something that's not honest. And which is why I am so radical. I'm like, where are the young people? Can we all come here and speak the truth to these people? Because lots has changed and there are people who are career, they're career protesters and they've made a career out of you know, the struggles of our people. And they don't present a, they don't present a very yeah. well rounded and a true reflection of who we are. Yeah. And that frustrates me and which is why I'm always like, okay, where were you before Mr. Floyd was so tragically killed? Why were you not interested before? Why did you just turn your face away from all those injustices before? And now that you've woken up, I want you not just to share a black screen. I want you not just to attend a rally because it's the politically correct thing to do. I want you to become involved in such a way that we challenge um, injustice every time we see it. So if there is injustice that happens to um, a white person, we call it out. If it's, if it's black on white, we call it out. If it's black on black, we call it out. If it's Asian on black, it doesn't matter where it is that we're people that say things honestly and truly and we call things out where it needs to be called out okay that's interesting so you're saying that we need to tackle this not from a self-righteous aspect but from our wholesome aspect but do you not think that okay which i agree by the way but you don't think that in this case it's just an overwhelming imbalance like there's a thousand causes we can do this like this, this, this i'm passionate about the immigrant the, the, the home office i'm very passionate about the home office and the immigration yep Kind of things that's one we could take you know the asylum seekers that's, but then this this just seems to be the ordained moment for this specific cause you don't think like for example like to address the question of why now why now why now it just seems to be you know me and there's a friend who always says you know the the, the, the day you wake up is your morning <laughs> so no, no, like, I, for you you know you you go from there you wake up you hit the ground running and you start okay what is it ordained be specific a moment that in time, you know, the Bible says there's a time for this, there's a time for that, there's a time for, so that time that is ordained for this, the time that, that what, is the, so, what is the this, what falls into that bracket of this? The perfect, so the, the perfect storm of people can ha have the moment to say, well, actually, I've been a, I've been a victim of, race, of racism, because I have many mm -hmm. friends in this country, moms, mixed race people, you know, people who are born here, people moved here, and I, they, no, we never ever saw them talk about racism, it was always a case of, Oh, I didn't get the job because I was black. That's as far as I go. And it's like, oh, all right. Then we move on from another conversation. Like we never ever sat down to, 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 to dig into it. And, you know, now I'm hearing mom say, if my kid goes to school, one of those days in that year, there's going to be a racial um, event, you know? So what you're saying is you feel like people have been given permission to yes. express. Yeah, yeah. Like, the, like this has been the perfect storm for every single person on the spectrum to say i've experienced it at this level me at this level me at that level some people are even going back to when they were kids to say when i was a kid xyz so it just seems like that that the moment of of, of lifting the lid has come mm -hmm. but i get what you're saying there's that thing of um you know sometimes you get a message about you know sign this petition sign this petition sign this petition sign this petition mm -hmm. And you know, you just sign and you move, or you don't really dig into it, or you don't even sign, you just leave it at the back of your mind. That does happen. The fact that sometimes things come on our table and we don't invest, we don't dig in, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's there's an element, I don't want to say hypocrisy, but there's an element of, of overlooking that, that that has been there of us overlooking stuff in the past. I would have to agree. I would have to agree. But I think this is just a moment. What I think about is this is just a moment to focus, like you're saying, to focus, 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 to just try and actually move things forward. Exactly. So I am for, you know, if, if this is a moment that encourages people to, you know, unburden themselves with hurts and things which genuinely have hurt, hurt them and so forth. When I tell people about the CV story, it, I mean, it was just a joke, but it's true. It genuinely happened. And, you know, if, if that's a time for this, that's excellent. Um, and I think that's good for the culture in general. My question is, you know, 
again, which I keep saying is where, which is why I ask you, where are we going? Because if it is just an expression of emotion, then what we do is we, we allow, it's almost like we allow people, to, you know, in a counseling session, someone opens up to you and then you just walk out the door and you leave them in this broken emotional state and you've not actually done anything, which is why when we go to a counselor, when we do any counseling, as you know, as they open up, then we give them tools to come out of that place victorious. My problem is, is that the narrative is very much encouraging people to un, you know, display their wounds and their battle scars, but leaving them unable to get up and keep going. And actually you've left them in a worse state than what you found them in, and that's not helpful. So when people talk about the victimhood narrative, I'm actually thinking, you know, what this is actually doing, which is the thing that I am kind of coming at is, I want people to express themselves, but I don't want people who end up being caught up in the trauma. Mm -hmm. And that's unhealthy and irresponsible for any of us, any of us who have any influence to do. Whereas, yes, I want you to express the things that you're feeling, but I don't want you stuck here. Mm -hmm. And as a people and as a nation, I, I mean, there's an Afro nation here, um, for many times, that's all we're allowed to do. We get to the point of expressing, we never deal with that hurt. And then when the next, and I pray it never happens again, but you know it's going to happen again. Then we unburden again. And we're stuck in the cycle of victimhood just because no one is giving us the tools to be able to deal with the pain that we're feeling. Got you. Well, there's two things to that. That's why I think, one, it's important that the church gets involved. I Ooh. think, yeah, the church actually has to, I was saying to people, it's not, it's not just about preaching, you know, the fact that we are now in Christ, we now have a new identity, that, they, that there's a bridge to that, essentially, you know. It's about actually, that's why conversations, conversations actually counseling opportunities. Like that's how you counsel people. That's how you get them from being out of stuck in the mud. We also have this thing about separating ourselves, which really that's one of, if I had to have a conversation, an, an audible conversation with God, like sitting face to face where I answer and he responds to me then. And I, ask, I always ask him, God, why is it the fact that we always feel the need to separate ourselves from a thing? We always feel whenever something is happening, you know, we just find reasons not to be involved and then just remove ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. Obviously, if we respond that way, then people remain, we don't engage with the culture, we don't engage with things where they are. So we, the, the actual healing power of Christ remains on this side, and then the people who are trying to get justice and um, reformation remain on the other side, you know? So that's why I think more than ever the church has to get involved. But secondly, the thing about people remaining in trauma, I think it also, a problem with that is we, the, 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 the healing involves the opposite side as well, if you realize. It involves change on the opposite side. So, for example, you know, there's, there's a couple called, they run the radio. Have you heard of the Radio and Brighter community? Yes, yes. Yeah. I know them very yeah. well. Fiona is phenomenal. And Michael Fiona, is and they put very out, well. They have been putting out some interesting videos. I watched one yesterday, and they, 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 they tackle why we are remaining. In that video, they said about how they've confronted systems in the form of we're looking for change. Sit at the table with actual stakeholders, people in, institu in institutions to address things, and it just does not go anywhere. And this t explains to us why America is the way it is, why they have come to the point whereby, uh, like, this thing is just boiling up because. For years and years, they come to the table. For years and years, they come to the table. Demand change, da, 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 prison reforms, you know, this and that. Can and I push back a little bit on this. Okay, okay. Let me, let me, let me, let me, yeah, that's, this is why we're here. So it's not a case of, it's not a case of we are willingly here, that, that the Afro nation is willingly here. It's almost like they've been pushed here because even when they come to the tables, things don't change. People still get arrested. People still get murdered. People still get um, hassled in, in, in shops and that kind of thing. So it's almost, it's not just us. It needs to be a wholesome approach, if that makes it, especially since it's a, it's, it's a mixture of circular and change. Not everyone is Christian. Not everyone, not, everyone, not everyone has the same remedy. So unfortunately, I feel like if those systems don't change and you have people who are tired of talking, you know, you think about in a relationship, if you keep talking and talking and talking, the person doesn't change, you leave the relationship, you check out, or you, you enter some sort of self-preservation mode, you know? So why is it different for the Afro nation? Why, 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 why do, and that's the thing about rioting. I'm so anti-rioting, I'm so anti-looting, but I feel like we don't look at it in a wholesome way. We just imagine people just got here and started breaking windows. Obviously, there's opportunists. Let's, let's be serious. There's people, there's, there's people who come in to just 
still and for the person for people who are angry chanting on the street and you know chanting at police which you shouldn't do which we should not defund the police by the way let's be let's be clear on that we should, but yeah but yes please keep the police going you know make, help, help them do what they do so it's just the fact that we need to look at why things aren't moving forward it's not enough to put that it's not okay to put that on the black people justice so we have to put it on the system on the other side of, of the coin as well, you know, the other races and that sort of thing. I just think that's the truth in the church and the fact that it's, it's not just us, it's, there's, a, there's an entire system here, there's an, an, an other variables at play. Yeah. Wow. I have so many questions. Let me see. Let me see where we can. <laughs> I think, all right. Let's, 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 let's start here. When you say push back on the other races, you just mean white, right? No, I mean, every, yeah, okay. Generally, why? Because that's who I'm seeing, seeing as the aggressor. You okay. know? All right. Okay. Let's start there. Let's start there. Um, I think <clears throat> one of the things I, I, I did a talk, um, which went down hilariously, I think it went quite well, of why I, um, I, I reject black culture. Um, mm -hmm. I said, and the, the, the purpose of the talk was basically saying that uh, black culture is a culture that's um, it's almost like a second wave of colonialism that um, wants me to reject my Africanness to fit into a whitewashed, cleaner version, which is the African American stereotype. Okay. And I find that hugely frustrating. Um, I think. What is black culture? Define that. You define that by uh, give me an example of like a black culture thing. Okay. Um, let me. Uh, okay. So. The very idea that something like the word black culture exists is a bit confusing to start with. Um, you know, you have friends who are from West Africa. Yeah. Friends who are from South Africa. Yeah. I have friends from the Caribbean. Yeah. Although there's similarities, it's about, you know, it's, it's, it's so massively removed. We're so massively rem removed from each other and that we actually look at each other and we make fun of each other all the time because we're like, yeah you people et cetera, et cetera. yeah you eat that as well so, yeah yeah <laughs> and, and, and so what's happened is that if we call it the 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 structure my mom calls it whiteness but the structure mm -hmm. in order to stop us from truly identifying with ourselves has just painted the picture where it's like okay the people closest to us are the african americans so we will force every other black person to fall into this same category which is why um everybody well i can't say everybody but for the most part we see you know rap culture the wearing of shorts etc it influences it has influenced our people so much because this is the next best available that's acceptable to the shall we say the current systems and power and so that's why i reject it because i'm like you i'm not going to be african-american to make it easier for you i want you to pronounce my name okay. i want you to understand how many languages there are i want you when you talk about my country to talk about my country not talk about continent Africa, yes yes you know, be specific i want you to start learning and understanding who i am mm -hmm. um so that that's kind of my place of rejection for it um i think one of the questions i wanted to ask you there's so many i should have been writing them now um was Actually, let me push. Why is it that you feel mm -hmm. that I I do agree with you that we need all every race involved in this, but why do you feel that um, the emphasis is more on the other races rather than actually it being a mirror back on ourselves mm -hmm. to see how we treat ourselves? That's a good question. It's not, not the emphasis on the other races. It's just to say we're. I may have worded that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So I feel like the, 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 we we need because we we we're responding to a thing. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? We're responding to a thing. Like for example, we're, resp we're responding to to four of three officers on the back of George Floyd. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. we, we just can't be asking George Floyd to 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 quiet down. What about like he, he was he was he was actually underneath three other officers. Does that make sense? So the scenario has other players. If that makes sense, we're not um devoid of, of 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 variables of other of, of other radicals in the situation it's it, we have to look at it wholesomely and say the other players there's other actors in the movie there's other um people in the scenario that are are, are bringing this storm essentially yeah. there's the wind there's the sun and the, everything plays in the weather and so unless we I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking outside Christianity but I'm talking about the world as well because we know in Christianity yeah we're talking about now 
put in the world together as a whole. So other players, Claudia, every, everyone needs to, every one of us needs to still fix them, like humanity. And that's another thing, it's, it's about humanity. As, as humans, you know, we were not put here as islands, if that makes sense. We were put here to relate. So it has to be a collective effort. I understand that. Yeah, we're headed. I, I love this kind of conversation. So what happened to, I, I, I even feel horrible just saying his name like that. What happened to Mr. Floyd? I mean, just, it's, it's not even racist, it's evil. It's just evil. That I don't even want to give it racism. Like it first is evil and then it's all these other things. I think, therefore, if we're getting all the races involved, let's, you know, one of the things we talked about before we started this is, you know, during this corona period, African people were kicked out of, in China, they weren't allowed, they were kicked, evicted from their homes, they were treated like dogs, they weren't allowed to shop, and they were literally treated like subhumans. Yep. And this narrative is heard from, in Arab countries, it's heard about in Asian countries, but there isn't the same visceral yes. response. Yes. And, you know, I just, you know, in, in, in that pushback to be like, okay, I, I want us to look at our reaction, okay? okay? And although our, our reaction in this area, 100%, this, I mean, I'm not generally for the death sentence, but this man should never see the light of day again, okay? And his four colleagues who are accomplices to that murder, that's, that's, that's the truth. I'm not at all like minimizing that but let's view our response our response to that one at incident and brianna taylor and many others was but you know the cry from other brothers and sisters but it just happens to be at the hands of somebody else no one seems to be responding and so when i say i'm questioning the response i'm questioning actually the the narrative that's pushing on the emotions it's almost like we're being emotionally manipulated by a narrative that's making us respond in some way. In my opinion, many African countries should boycott China completely. And, you know, there's an economic takeover happening at the moment just, just from the treatment of our people in their countries um, and other places like that. And my question really is, people, people might say, oh, that's different. What's happening at the same time? And if we care about justice, then we call it out every time we see it. It should, it shouldn't be like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I heard about that. That's sad. No, no, you didn't hear okay. about it. That's sad. Yes. That's not an acceptable response. Yeah. For some, especially if your response to that thing is the same, it's not an acceptable response for us to respond like that. And that's why I'm like, let's look at ourselves a little bit here. Yeah. Because we accept things and we accept our brothers and sisters going through certain things. But if it's not at the hands of a white man, if it's at the hand of somebody who looks like us, then it's so, I mean, that's sad. I'm like, you know what? I, I, I have to agree, Claudia, because I was, I, was, I was going to do a private video on my own response. And I thought I'm going to bring it in from a colorism point of view. Yep. As, as I said, we cannot afford to approach a thing from a self-righteous point of view because phew, black people, we are the worst, like it begins with us, like we are the worst towards each other. Even the black American culture, after you lift off the whole racism thing, they, they, they live in this whole light skin, dark skin thing. Move over to Africa, where we have nepotism. People, 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 you, you, you have political regimes that only hire when they come into power, you just know only a certain number of tribes are going to get the spots in the government and, you know, uh, going to be allowed to maneuver how they want to maneuver uh, when it comes to things like um, entrepreneurship and getting permission from ministries to do this and that. Even come to the marriage sector, some 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 tribes pay yes. a bride price for light skinned girls and they do for dark skinned girls, you know. So even within us, there's a lot that we need to address, which which always brings me back to the fact that this is really a sin issue. And the more gospel preaching we do, the more we fight racism because at the core, yo, we're sick. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 You know, the thing is, as you point the finger, there's fingers, and you know, people say, "Oh, you." People say, "I'm not black enough." I get this all the time. I'm like, "Okay, cool." What, <laughs> what the heck does that mean? But the, the thing is, you know, if we're going to force white guilt, mm -hmm. then at the same time, by us doing doing the action, we have to accept black shame. That's just the truth of it. So this dynamic is constantly happening and you can't just ignore the stuff that's coming back on us to yeah. be like, okay, how do we treat ourselves? 
how do we shoot ourselves? Yeah. You know, you know, let, let me, you know, you know, it, um, there's been scandals of people, our own people who um, will take advantage of people who are struggling with the immigration system, steal thousands of pounds from them. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like people are like, Expect like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I, I really feel like if, if we're heading to this point of healing that we really want to is that justice comes, but righteousness comes as well. So that where, where, where there is an imbalance that things, power systems are shifted, but at the same time, a moral kind of standard gets lifted. If people don't know what it is that they're shooting for, then you have all these offsprings that we get even confused about what the original message was. And we're like, oh wait, is it police brutality? Is it systemic? Let's be clear, specific, consistent. I found like I sound like a politician. I should go into politics. You're quite right. You're quite right. But I have to just say one thing. Only one thing can do that. And you know what it is? It's church involvement. That's it. That's it. That's it. You know, so the challenge for us is how do we get the church? That's it. That's what. That's the challenge for every Christian who has a passion for this is how do we get the church to bridge the gap? The problem is, let me tell you this, let me tell you, this, let me just say this. <laughs> the hour, I know, I think it's, 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 let me just say it. The hour for let's separate ourselves is gone. Thank you. The hour to say, oh, you know, this is connected to that, so I'm not going to get involved, and this is connected to that, so I'm going to stay home, and this is like, that you, I don't think that's, I'm going to say, I don't think that's God's plan anymore. Like, I think it's, we're, whole, we're in a whole new era where God, you know, the Bible does say go. Christ does say go. So I don't know where we get this thing of we should be removed from, you know, the Holy Spirit help us. Then the, the, there's that scripture that says, um, be, what is it? it says, I'm sending you out as doves in the middle of sheep. We just want yeah. to remain as doves in the cage. We don't want to go out and maneuver among the sheep, uh, among the wolves, you know? Look. So, 11 a.m. Mm -hmm. is the most segregated. This is what I wrote on the blog. It is the most segregated hour across the world, which let's is why. Down, let's break that down. Why do you think let's that? Break... Okay. Well, we, we need to discuss why that is. So in the blog, what I said yes. was because we have accepted sectarianism. Yes. So if sectarianism is there, that's actually the guilt that stops us from being able to call out some of these other issues. Mm -hmm. I was um, at a meeting basically a think tank meeting for um, churches in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And they spent maybe 15, 20 minutes discussing the redeemed. <laughs> no, we're the redeemed, the what? redeemed, the redeemed are the fastest growing, the redeemed, the redeemed. And I was there with my friend. Uh -huh. um, and then we looked at each other. I, I don't attend the redeemed church, but that's neither here nor there. And I stood up, I was like, why don't you just invite them? And there was another pastor from Destiny who was like, you know, stop talking about them. Let's just invite them. But the problem is, you know, because we're in our own little factions and we want to fly my flag, you know, I'm Church of Scotland no. or I'm Anglican or I'm Ca that becomes more important than actually our identity. In Christ. Yes. If we strip our way, now I ask these people, if you're a racist, that's fine. If you strip away, if you're a ra regardless of who you're, if you strip away your racial identity, who are you? And actually, Deeper than that, because if you do any evangelism in Glasgow, you talk to people about Jesus, they'll either say to you, oh, I'm Catholic, or, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, and I'm like, your Catholicism or your Protestantism has got nothing to do with Jesus. Like, wh where is Jesus in this? And because we allow these divisions in the church, people think that there is representation because people's man-made ministries are in the room. I'm like, nah. If we come back to that original identity of followers of Christ and we leave our egos and our ministries behind, then all of a sudden we start to mix. Mm -hmm. And what I said to people, I remember I told you, I started church hopping. I, I went late night services. I went to all sorts just to experience oh, the differences and the, ex the difference in the expression of worship. You know, the, the expression of worship in a predominantly Chinese church was so much fun. Um, wow! Very, we that out. We need to go. <laughs> and expression of worship is also different. You know, if I go to a predominantly black uh, black church, or if I go to a predominantly hey, white. Church, hey, and then oh my God! Is good one time. <laughs> between the classes, if you go to a particularly middle class church, which yeah. I, it's the first time I've ever felt black in my life. I mean, I felt. <laughs> 
it was like violins and somebody started uh, playing it. And I was like, classical, yeah. I'm like, what, what's going on? I, I really became aware of myself and I made other people uncomfortable because I'm in the back going, uh, because I'm culturally trained that if we're going to sing a song, there's yeah. a bit of movement. To it. Yeah. And they're all looking and I'm like, well, this is who I am. <laughs> I'm invading your space. Yeah. And in the same way, you know, if somebody's coming to our church, it's all very, you know. Yeah. They're expecting, where are the beats? When is the beat dropping? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But the thing is, people are, we, we have been trained to experience, <laughs> I find this hilarious. People have been trained to experience God is only here in this. You know, in some churches, it's when the pianist does a little frill. And it's like a little, hmm, <laughs> ghost is here. And then people are like, oh. I'm like, wait, God's been here from the very beginning. I know, that, that's it, that's the light. I feel God. I'm like, I'm like, really? really? This is just, this is just religious training. You may go to a Quaker, which is my background, Quaker background, where no one says anything. The idea is we need to step up our spirituality where we're not following the doctrines and traditions of man. And we should be able to recognize God where we see him. And if it's not our usual, if it's not, you know, what we normally expect, we, we're just carnal. Like, we need to look past that. Um, just final one, and then I'll let you go. Uh, we were at this training conference, and there's a man from an Asian background, and he, he's Indian, and, you know, he had us on the floor on our knees and, like, rocking back. I mean, it was the weirdest thing I've ever experienced. But he was, and then he was like singing the Psalms, never experienced something like this. It was very strange. I was very, very uncomfortable. But in the midst of that, God was there. And we need to raise that. We need to raise that. Somebody's spirituality is not in how much they know. It's not in how much they shout. Spiritual authority is spiritually discerned. We need the church to wake up. Got you. Got you. I second that. I'm with you on that. I'm with, I don't like the labels. Um, so I really don't like the labels, you know, um, you over there, you're Pentecostal, I'm over here, I'm conservative evangelical, and they're like, it, it's, 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 it's not God's plan for sure. But if we have to unpack that a bit, um, Claudia, you know, church boils down to people at the end of the day. Yep. If I come to church, if I come to a congregation and I can't relate to people, and this is one of the reasons why I think, I don't know about you, um, I think America is a whole other ball game. But here in the UK, we know people cling to cultures. If I come into your congregation and I sit there, and which I think is why you're right, we need to raise our 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 spiritual, like what is like what is church, what is, who is Christ? Because we come into our congregation, we sit and the worship doesn't appeal to us, maybe, and we feel like okay, because the worship doesn't appeal to me, I need to find a worship that appeals to me, so I'll find, you know, the drum set. Or but there's also a cultural aspect in, in terms of people. If you come into a congregation and you don't feel welcome, you don't feel part of the people, you don't feel church is supposed to, you know, church is that was the, the, the house meeting originally. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, people, I love that. People understood each other, people had conversations where they could relate to each other. So I feel like there's a, re a relational barrier here in the UK. People. I would agree with that. I, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. yeah, so I think that the relational barrier is real. The fact that if I if I came to a, a, a certain a, a specific congregation, I wouldn't feel like I'm at home. Like this is my home group. Like this is my house. That 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 experience would be different. So people just instead of I think stay and try and acclimatize, people just take off to what they believe will be their home group. But then they just stay and then it moves from the house to the church, and then suddenly you have this African church and everyone just sticks to their own. So yeah, that's an uphill. You know, I think no. I, I understand. I understand that. Um, I would say that there's something about young people that where there isn't that banner, like young people generally, I mean, aren't that interested in these archaic institutions. But actually, as they stay, what I what I what I find is this. So I I lead a Bible study that is open to everybody and anybody. Is that's that's how it works. We're not stuck to one church. And in fact, most of our people who attend don't attend our church. And that's, that's really awesome. I love that. That's the kind of studies that I've always been involved in. I dislike, this is our, you know, what I find is that people, people, once they start attending, mm -hmm. what the church does is indoctrinates them that they're better than the person around the corner. They're indoctrinating them with this sectarianist, 
type culture that makes them feel like they're better than. And if they even relate with somebody who doesn't attend their thing, that there's a chance that they might get infected or, you know, or, you know, they might fall off the bandwagon because they allow this, but we don't allow this. Really, you know, what I love, which is springing up, and I'm so excited after this lockdown period, because I feel like God has had the church on lock to be like, remember who, what the church actually is, yeah. is these springing up of worship nights, which are just worship nights. Mm -hmm. There's somebody with a guitar, they're singing. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. There's people, Christians from every walk and background. There's eccentric people. There's very conservative people in the same space. And the growth of these places is what's really important. And I really feel like the real emphasis for me personally in my prayer time is a move, you know, it's almost a re-embracing of holiness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like as we go forward, the idea that somebody's going to build their ministry, mm -hmm. I think, you know, I just, I just don't think people are going to get away with it anymore. I think really the goal is we want to disciple not, not our street. We want to disciple nations. nations uh, and if we're discipling nations, nations don't care about who your bishop is or who your geo is. They don't care. <laughs> what they need is solutions. And solutions come through abandoning prayer and studying the word mm -hmm. and a genuine love and compassion for people. Mm -hmm. And if you have a genuine love and compassion for people, you do not have to describe this. You, you won't dismiss their experiences. You won't dismiss um, the things that they've said. And you'll actually get them to the point of understanding that all of this external stuff, although it's part of who we are, the most important thing is the understanding that we are deployed, not employed. We are deployed as ambassadors for Christ yeah. to set his kingdom yeah. here on earth. Yeah. And that's our job. Yeah. Oh, you see, that's so succinct and bang on. Like nothing I can add to that, honestly. And it's only when we do that when we come, when we then we come to that conclusion that we can actually go out. We can actually send out ambassadors because now they're not worried about or oh, what's the doctrine like. They're just so secure in the fact that it's God at the heart of it. It's Christ in me, and they won't be so cautious about being in the world and trying to influence the world because they understand that it's not about labels. It's about Christ going forth into the nations. I love that. I love that so much. You know, Old Testament, you touch the leper, you get unclean. Mm -hmm. New Testament, leper touches you, they become clean. Just huge. And you know, I, I'll just go out on the street sometimes and just evangelize. And the thing is, it's trying to get people out of their pews. The yeah. church is no, you know, people aren't coming to church. We need to bring that genuine care and love and bring it to people mm -hmm. so that we're there you know, on, on, on every route and, and, we're, and we're going out. So in our workplaces that they're literally, we're taking our workplaces for Jesus. We're taking every space that we take in. And it's not about pounding people with the Bible mm -hmm. because <laughs> people are attracted to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if we know that Jesus is within us, then that's what attracts people. And what's been so fun, they probably won't watch this, but what's been so fun in this lockdown period is my colleague saying, Claudia, is, you're so calm. Like when you come around, you're so calm. I really love that. Is this your faith stuff? Wow. Yes, it's Jesus. You ought to know Jesus. Ha, 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 ha. I'm forcing you to come to church. I'm not going to go all burn in hell. No, you won't. Jesus loves you. And it's the demonstration of the peace that I carry that's drawn them in to bring that conversation. It's not slapping somebody with the Bible. Relational that we genuinely care with people. Relational. So let's marry that to the current situation. What does that look like? What does that look like? It looks, it looks like the word. I want to know relationally, how are we going to get involved? How are we going to go? Listen, man, the, your, your mission field is everywhere around you. That's your mission field. Your job is to take that. So one of the things that I get so frustrated are people are like, it's not my job to educate white people on this and this and this and this. Truth is in, in my life, I'm just speaking for me. I am, for most of my white friends, the first black person they've ever met. Yeah. I'm really sorry. That it, if they leave, it's the same thing as Christianity. I'm, I'm normally the first Christian that, they ever, uh, that they've ever met. Mm -hmm. If they leave with an assumption that is not true based on their experiences, I've not done a good job. So when they meet me, I want them to understand my background. I want them to understand who I am. I want them to see a clear picture of Christianity. And if you 
are too proud to be, and, and I mean this in the kindest way, if, if we really want change, it's about, the thing is, this conversational relationship. If, if we try and push equality and we don't bring people along, we're, all we're doing is we're flipping the switches and we want black supremacy, which yeah. is just as ugly, just as brutal. We yeah. want people to come along with us. So, you know, if your friend reaches out to you and asks for the first time because they have become awakened to an issue, yeah. they've just become awakened to it. Yeah. They probably didn't know. Yeah. Don't assume guilt on their part. Yeah. So let's, let's talk. Let's have discussions. Please free your friends from white guilt. Don't let them, don't let the media generate a narrative for them in their head. Let it be true. Let it be honest. Let them see a representation that's you know, that's wholesome, that shows the kings and queens of African nations, that shows the diversity in culture, that shows the diversity in language, and that shows the, you know, music and food and all of these things. Let them know and understand that. And what I find, what I found for most, <laughs> most white people become aware of, shall we say, become aware of their skin color when they're when they see another picture. So everywhere around us, we are surrounded by what is white culture. But when they start to experience something else, all of a sudden they see themselves yeah. from a different light. Yeah. And if you're not willing to do that, please don't complain. Gotcha. So harsh. <laughs> I know, but facts. facts, <laughs> facts, facts, facts. Well, don't know to actually, yeah, I agree with you. There's nothing I could add to that. Trailer. That is so, but I'm glad we agree. So we actually agree. We agree. What did I think we didn't agree on? You know we agree. You know we agree. I think um, sometimes I'm a little bit more harsh um, with things, but I'm like the the issue of like we need to own it, and we need to own it. We we, we need to own it, and we um, and owning it. Sorry, let me just switch this in there. Owning this also involves us calling our privilege or receiving. So yes. You know, we, we are all privileged in different ways. Acknowledge, everybody needs to check their privilege at the door. And when we all check our privilege at the door, we can have a real conversation. Mm -hmm. If you come in like, I have nothing to check at the door, you're not going to get anywhere. Oh, so. so, yes. <laughs> Got you. Now, um, I'm going to have to get you back. We need to talk about this book. Okay, so I'm just going to on the side, organize a time to come back and we can talk about money. Money, money. Yeah, let's Yes. Yeah, so can we talk about that? That we can we can cover that economic side of this whole thing as well. I think we can throw it inside there as well. And yeah. So anything else you'd like to add before we conclude? Um, I would say everybody to read the Black Lives Matter manifesto and make sure you understand what is you know the movement that you're supporting, okay. rather than just a hashtag. That's okay. what I'd say. Oh, so we can't close on that. We need to dive into this again. What if, talk, to me, talk to me about Black Lives See, this is the thing about Black Lives Matter. I feel like Black Lives Matter, okay, say, yeah, it's been founded by, um, who's been founded by, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm feeling it's about common ground, if that makes sense. Like, for example, I don't, I don't, I'd like it. The, the, the person who had me in the past wasn't a, a, a born again Christian, probably, probably who knows what they do with their money, what they do with the proceeds from the business. But we have a job to do. So we meet on a Monday, you know, we coordinate a project, we plan a project, you know, we, we, we email someone, so we get the tender done. So it may be about common ground more than it is about all that other, that's, this is, I'm, I'm willing to listen up, to listen to, about this, but I'm feeling it's about common ground. It's about how do we get involved where we can influence this. Because let's be honest, every protest happening in the Western world will probably be under the Black Lives slogan. Another thing is, I spoke to the organizer, one of the organizers of the one, the first one in Glasgow, and she said that was just a hashtag. It wasn't that we're part of the movement. We just said Black Lives Matter because Black Lives Matter. It wasn't a case of we're part of the organization or supporting that explicitly. It was just a case of Black Lives Matter. Does that make sense? And this is the hashtag. Yeah. Yeah, I, I understand that. I see that argument. Um, I guess I put it back to you as um, there are some people who genuinely believe that America is the greatest country in the world and have felt in the last 20 years it's no longer. And they believe that we should make America great again. 
but may not be supporters of Trump. What I'm saying is mm -hmm. uh, just, I, I understand that it falls in the banner and that we have our own sentiments and so forth. I think one of the things that frustrates me hugely is mm -hmm. that as an Afro nation, um, like this Afro nation biz, yes, man, <laughs> we're nation. Yes. Um, is that we, I feel like there's generally a lot of manipulation yeah. and um, you know, it's a horrible stereotype, but people have made the statement that if you want to hide something from a black person, you should put it in a book. And mm -hmm. I, I'm, you know, if, if you read, you know, I think if you're part of any movement, mm -hmm. any movement whatsoever, mm -hmm. it is imperative that you read about it and you read and you see, and <laughs> we were having a back and forth and people were like, um, go read some more and what's so fun for me is because I, I think I've read everything so I can say yeah I've, I've read almost everything but and I can create an educated opinion on that so bef it is time for us to read if you're in America before you vote read the manifesto mm -hmm. and see how that's gonna you know help you and if you're in the UK read the manifesto don't just, just because it comes on a certain slogan, just don't just go along with the wave. Read and understand what it is that you're following, campaigning and promoting. That's, that's all I'm saying. So I'll give you an example. You know, if, if somebody is for um, independence and, you know, they want independence for Scotland, you do know that SNP is not the only choice that you have. There's more choices that, and you can look at the SNP party and say, you know, I don't agree with it. And actually I feel like my, because I'm a responsible voter, I'll vote for a party that more accurately represents the sentiments that I have politically. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a responsibility. And I get frustrated with people who don't read and it's important that you read. And the thing is you might read it and think, Yep, hundred percent. I agree with everything. There's, it's, it's a good article. It's very well written, very well structured. But you might read that and go, "No, actually, I don't agree with this, this, and this, and this." Yeah. And if you don't, then I really want to, you know, there may be some time for you to think back and reflect on that, and be like, "I don't, I don't need to be demonstrated for." Okay. And there, there, yeah. yeah. I think it may be what may be worth just um, maybe creating another hashtag then because for me when I say Black Lives Matter I just mean Black Lives Matter I don't mean Black Lives Matter if that makes sense so it's interesting to see that when you hashtag that people think you're voting for a party yeah but yeah I suppose that 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 is the connotation given the fact that we're in a world where everything is essentially almost political, seen as political. So I suppose you said in the social sense, yeah, it, it looks that way. So it may be worth getting another hashtag. But what happens when that's hijacked again? <laughs> if it's hijacked again, that's fine. My my thing is that I'm worried that people, you know, of the Afro nation feel like if they create a protest of themselves, no one will pay attention to them. So they need to jump on this bandwagon of black because we don't have the confidence to create something like that. Oh, okay. I'm just like, gotcha. you know, this is actually part of the problem again, where okay. it's coming and it, you know, what happened was awful, but it's coming from America and black culture. So everybody who's of the skin color, agree with it, yeah. agree with it. By yeah. And you may not agree with everything, but you must yeah. submit that. Which I don't agree with that, but that monolithic, everyone gets needs to be forced into this. Yeah. Exactly. Or you get cancelled or, yeah. Yeah. diversity of thought i refuse to be put into this narrative box yeah. that you want to put me into and you know if i look at that manifesto i have every right to disagree um i, I don't have to hashtag it mm -hmm. and i want us to have the confidence to call out things where it needs to be mm -hmm. and can i say at this juncture listen if you're in the in the uk there's been some horrendous policies particularly the fgm policy that was made in england um off the rhetoric of one of these lifelong career, shall we say, protesters of black lives. Mm -hmm. And she, because of the organization and to secure funding, said some horrendous things that en ended up having a woman put in jail, which I think was unjust. Mm -hmm. And the whole community, the white community was like, yeah, that's great. And we as a community sat back and allowed these things to happen because we don't read, please. Let's all do, let's start reading, let's get involved very specifically to tackle issues specifically. And so when that happened, I was out in the streets protesting because that was a wrong thing to happen. And it was a law. I need to look into that. I've never heard of this FGM thing. 
yeah, no, I mean, it, I'll just give you a brief synopsis, sorry, before we finish. Um, mm -hmm. There was a, um, basically, the, the narrative was that um, she, cre the, the founder of this organization created a narrative that all Somalis are going to, people of Somali background are going to um, do FGM on their children and therefore they should be treated as if, you know, they're at risk and they should be watched by the police. And basically this created and perpetuated a law that meant people from countries that practices Somalis particularly were hit the worst by this, but people from countries like Nigeria and people like people from countries of Zimbabwe, that meant that every mother who was giving birth was put in an at risk and they were treated differently because of the rhetoric of one person. And my frustration is that the communities that are being affected, like you and like me, when we go and give birth, we would have been classed and probably still are, would be classed as high risk to harm our own daughters just because of the color of our skin. And we allow these things to continue happening because it's not trendy, it's not fashionable. People, let's, let's read, let's get involved. And where we see specific things, so I'm always like, let's be specific. When we see specific things, we call them out and we say that. And please more young people let's get involved because there are people who have been involved and in, it's almost like it's become path you know it's their job to show the hurts of the nation and in some of the things that they're doing is deeply hurtful to us and let's crush that because my first identity is christian it is not black yeah amen same here. <laughs> amen amen and on that note thanks for coming by the eagles nest claudia thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you in our next episode Thank you. <laughs>